computational linguist. It is a privilege, it is an honor, and a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor John Goldsmith. He is the uh, Edward Carson Wallman Distinguished Service Professor of Linguistics and of Computer Science at the University of Chicago. Uh, many of us are familiar with his very substantial contributions in the areas of phonology and morphology. In fact, all computational linguists, many, many computer scientists, and just about anybody who's ever had to analyze the structure of words by machine should be familiar with his linguistic uh, uh, computer program. It is a software system that takes in blank text, just surface forms, and gives you a morphological analysis. It learns the morphology of the, of the language. Learns from data. From data alone, right? Learns from, learns from scratch. If you look at the state of computational and linguistics today, you might say, of course it learns from data. But when John started doing this more than 20 years ago, and saying that, here, I'm just going to give you text files, and I'm going to give you the morphology of the, uh, of the language, this would have been considered a visionary, even a courageous. Uh, now, uh, John has authored and edited a number of uh, books, most recently a uh, battle in the minefields, where he looks at the, uh, the interconnections and the uh, divergence between the linguistics and psychology and philosophy. And this speaks to something in uh, his work in his career that's really inspiring to me. Is that computational linguistics is a field that is inherently uh, interdisciplinary. And throughout John's uh, work, you can see that he cares about the language part and the computational part of computational linguistics. He takes both sides uh, very seriously, and the combination of both, both things uh, very seriously, which is, uh, of course, uh, not true of every uh, computational linguist, but that's definitely something to be. Uh, Admire. Now we are now in computational linguistics at a very interesting time where there's a lot of talk about uh, the AI revolution, right? And uh, computational linguistics is a big part of that. And there is uh, a lot of hype, there is justified uh, enthusiasm, but there is uh, also uh, euphoria and fear and anger, and those are less desirable, right? And those come from a place that it, Maybe it's a little bit of a lack of uh, awareness of where we've been and how we got here, which gives us uncertainty about where we're going. So it is, we should feel uh, very fortunate that we have somebody who is up to the task looking at these very uh, important issues. So with that, I give you Professor John Goldsmith. Both of them remind us about people who are not here anymore. 
anything other people don't know them, but people like Chuck Fillmore, who's a, a mainstay of the LSA, and Ivan Zog, who really was the heart and soul of the Institute. And Jim McCauley was my colleague. I can't believe it's been 20 years since he left. This is a time to, to remember. And you don't know much about the history of the LSA, and I thought it'd be worthwhile um, telling you a little bit about it. The LSA started in 1924. Leonard Bloomfield and a couple other people thought it was a good time to create a professional organization for linguists, and they met together in, in New York around Christmas in 1924. And they had a great meeting, but the problem was people in those days, normal people didn't take airplanes anywhere. So if it were Berkeley or Stanford, you were not going to get to New York for a, for a three-day meeting. So this went on for a few years, and the idea emerged, not only solving that problem, but also solving the problem that almost nobody lived in a place where there were many linguists. Most people were just isolated linguistically, if they were linguists. So the idea was floated to create an institution, an institute during the summer, and it started in 1928. And um, the first home uh, institution was, was Yale. Um, sorry, but yeah, it was. And um, um, the, the institute, institutes stopped for a couple of years at the beginning of the 30s because of the Depression, but started up again. And the University of Michigan was a, was a, a heavy hitter in hosting the institutes that way. And the 1937 institute was very special. I'm getting my slides here. This is a nice slide. Uh, <laughs> I skipped over this. I'll get back to it. Um, down to uh, uh, the 37th Institute. It was a great institute, and it had the first, what some men call the field methods course, but we wouldn't call the field methods course today. It's a field methods course somehow, perhaps they were monkey, um, because the person who provided the judgments of the sentences on Navajo was Sapir himself, and I have to believe that he had arranged for someone to come and play that role, and then something fell through that, but I don't know that. <laughs> he taught a course in the Institute, and that was the list of people who were enrolled, and you notice they're all men. And the ones who have dates there, I put them in, they're people who were presidents of the LSA a few years later. They were really very uh, important contributors to American linguistics over the course of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, Fred Holzer, Hobbs Holzer was mine. My chairman is the person who gave me my first job in linguistics. And there they are. It was a wonderful um, field methods class, or almost field methods class. And this is, this, this is how it was described. I think it's really interesting. Let's just read it. So if you're on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 11, it's all to make this course as inductive as possible. The task will be sent to members of the class. That's what I said. Um, to find out all they can about the phonetics and morphology of some language, which is entirely unknown to them. The materials are not to be obtained from books, but by direct questioning, the phonetic notations of the class corrected by the instructor being the final authority. <laughs> no reference to printed literature will be allowed. It's hoped to show that a perfectly adequate grasp of any language, even a complex one, can be obtained by the direct phonetic approach. The phonetics needs and needed to carry on, to carry on the course, will be developed as need requires. It's, the, it's believed that the fear of some of these students of written languages had of the direct phonetic method is entirely unwarranted, and it's hoped that this course may do something to make real the oft-repeated statement that languages exist primarily as oral phenomena, not as, as written symbols. So, would you take the course? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, I find that, and I realized I have been to seven plus Epsilon linguistic institutes. The Epsilon was, in 1970, I had um, finished my sophomore year in college, and I went, uh, and in those days, there was a summer meeting at the LSA, so it was a two or three day meeting, um, in addition to the institute. So I went to that two or three day meeting, and I listened to everything I could, and I understood absolutely nothing. But it was great, it was inspiring. And so four years later, I went to the institute at UMass Amherst, and that was great, it was really hot and humid, and I was writing my dissertation, and so I was signed up for a course of 12 languages, and I didn't go. But Chomsky gave four lectures to standing room only crowds. Uh, four weeks in a row. It was quite amazing. 1982, University of Maryland. I was teaching Odyssey Mental Phonology. It was the first time I taught. And field went this course with Nibet. Boy, it was hot. It was hot. It was not hotter than here, but it was humid. And the next year at UCLA, I taught phonology. So it's just to sort of point out the different things that a person can do over these years. And have I pointed out to you 
how long ago 1970 was. I will not ask for a show of hands about where you were in 1970, or where your parents were in 1970. And in 1988, I went to that fantastic institute that I had sought, organized at Stanford. They did a course with some ancient home. It's not a field of class, but we knew a lot about the ancient home. And David Romelhart lectured to, to huge crowds talking about connectionism. Um, and I skipped through the 90s, doing a lot of computational linguistics, and Dennis Preston asked me, well, uh, invited me to teach a course at Michigan State, which was great, and I did that, and it was hot. Probably <laughs> <laughs> so I don't remember. But by then, everything had been invented. And four years ago, Chicago um, hosted the Institute, and I taught a course on um, computation and unsupervised learning and morphology. And now here I am, sort of in the third phase of what I'm passionate about, talking here about Adeline Heinfeld, this book about the interactions, ruptures, and continuity in these fields of linguistics, philosophy, psychology, and logic. Um, and here we are. So when I talk about this book, I'd like to give people a big handout. There it is. Which it's a visual index to all the people in this story. I know you can't read it. But over you see? Yeah, there it is. Not very bad. It uh, doesn't matter. Over there, the guy is in yellow or gold. Those are linguists. Each box is a linguist. And their position on the screen is determined by when they were born. So people at the top were born later than people at the bottom. These are mostly people here um, from the beginning of the 19th century, about until early in the 20th century. So we've got linguists, we've got um, philosophers in the middle, and psychologists on the right. A lot of this stuff, certainly not something to talk about in an hour. But I put together something similar, but much, much more restricted. But still, I got to talk pretty fast and tell you about all the things that you want to learn about these people. So this is these are some of the people I'm going to talk to you about. Over there on the left, you've got a couple of linguists. They themselves don't play a very important role. But Chomsky, I'm using in a sense as an icon and looking at influences on him just as a stand-in for influences on linguistics to some degree. Um, in their uh, in that kind of blue, purple, violet color, we've got some logicians, and there's not a sharp line between logicians and mathematicians sometimes. David Hilbert is a mathematician, was a mathematician, and he plays an important role in the story. The philosophers are in yellow here. The Vienna Circle is a circle, and they were active in the 20s and the first half of the 30s. And they play a role here. They played a very influential role in the rise of generative grammar in, in a fashion that I'm sure few of you are aware of. And then over here in this light blue, we've got um, the four generations of neural networks, and I thought you find it interesting to learn something about them. So here we are, we'll talk about neural networks, talk about the Anna Circle and their influence, uh, and their involvement with people who created both digital computers and had an impact on here we are with some logicians whose work very much influenced uh, Chomsky's development of the gender program. So those are the things I want to talk about. So the first thing I thought would be um, especially interesting to talk about. You will excuse me, I'm sure you're drinking as much water as I am. I do it in front of you. Sorry. Um, the first thing I thought it would be interesting to do was to compare what counts as success in linguistics at some high level, as opposed to what counts as success in the um, ACL. So I'm comparing LSA to ACL. LSA is us, guys, and I think of myself as mostly an LSA linguist. But oftentimes, I'm doing things and I consider myself an ACL linguist, a computational linguist as well. ACL stands for Association of Computational Linguists. Um, so I would like to show you in cartoon form how I can explain what it is that linguists do and what we take to be a success. I recognize that this is a little bit gener generation specific, and I think people of a later generation might uh, frame it or phrase it differently. But I'm, I'm describing it as I see it, and so your comments are certainly about. So what a linguist thinks of the success starts with developing a theory, a way of describing language, and that theory or that way of describing language is, is that yellow box. And you don't uh, describe language in the abstract, you describe particular languages. And so a description of a language, Russian and Israeli, let's say, could be those two boxes there. So a person who knows languages, 
develops a theory about them and makes sure that that theory allows them, them or anyone else to say what needs to be said about those languages. Once they're done, they look, once they've started the game going, they look for a partner or they get a, a graduate student. Yeah. Somebody's working on a new language, and that new language, it always happens, requires something else that wasn't in the old package. So the, the right grammar for that third language falls outside the original box, and so the box gets bigger, the toolbox of uh, linguist tools that they need in order to describe languages. <coughs> And that's fine. That's considered a uh, success as well. It's, it's a good thing. Um, having done that, we maybe get another graduate student where we think some more about it. doesn't matter, does it? But we observe all the, the possibilities in that range of possible languages that our theory offers. And we say, well, you know, there's a group down there that has never been observed. Of course, we only look at three languages. But we don't think there are any languages going to pop up there. So we're going to do a kind of a priori rejection of that whole area. So we shrink the box. Shrinking the box makes it clear that really our long-term goal is to have a very dense universe. That's what we're going to be aiming for. We're going to have a universe in which, a universe of theories, every language we study has a place in there, and we want it to be as dense as possible. So we made it, we haven't gotten any more empirical coverage in this that last step, but it's made denser so it's better. In some sense, in a way that would appeal to linguists, we've got a better idea. And we got another person, perhaps another graduate student, doing uh, work on a fourth language. And you know it, you need to add something to the grammar in order to count that language. And so this person, again, uh, expands the grammar. And that's how it goes. At the end of the long process, we hope that we'll get a yellow box, which is bigger than the one you see there, but which is um, really packed with lots of languages that have been set. A full box containing all the grammars densely. Well, you know, now this is this I'm not going to say to the um, ACL person, but I'll say it to you. Because maybe you're agreeing with me that, yeah, that's a perfectly reasonable characterization of what it is that linguists do. But you know, there's a bit of disingenuousness about putting it that way. And so that's why I'm just saying this sort of sotto voce in front of you, because we say that's how it is. But you know, I had a, I had a nightmare once, not very long ago. And it, in this nightmare, I had a, a, a graduate student who came and took three years of courses in syntax, morphology, phonology, advanced courses. He got a grant, went to study a, a language in a family nobody had ever studied it. And they had 12 months to go there, and they came back 12 months later. We had heard not, there was no internet, there was nothing. They came back, and the first thing they did was give a colloquium for the department. And they got up and they said to, to their you know, fellow students, they said, you know, of course, we took a really terrific, we studied the syntax of English, of Swahili, we studied the morphology of, you know, on and on. And then this person says, well, you know, I got there and I started studying the language, and yeah, of course, I had to learn some vocabulary, but, you know, never mind, the syntax was exactly like English. And, and we believe it, the morphology was exactly like Swahili, and the phonology was exactly like, you know, Kinderwanda, or whatever. And, you know, and they said, so I really got it all done in six months, and I just spent the second six months drinking beer, getting more fluent in this great language. And so what do you do when you have somebody who comes back like that? You, you know, you don't believe it. You don't believe it. it. It isn't possible that you go out and study a new language and everything works. And that tells you what we really think about linguistic theory. We really do think that the effort is in making it bigger and finding those grammars. It's not the box. Oh, we don't tell the ACL linguist that. That's just among us. <laughs> but the ACL linguist says, listens to all this. Excuse me, you're not making that. The ACL linguist listens to all this and says, well, okay, I, I don't like that very much what you're doing, but you seem to understand what you're doing. But I tell you, we do think about it differently. We start off with a model, and we know it isn't right, we know it isn't perfect, but there's that blob there. Call it you. It's a universe that we happen to be interested in studying these days right now. And we've got some data that we're setting up. It's our, our corpus. Um, and we're going to see how well our methods, specified by you and something else, which I'll mention in just a second, how well those methods deal with the, the uh, data in that red box. Still the ACL member talking. 
So what we do, they say, what we do is have an algorithm that finds parameters within this universe that we care about. And typically there's an iterative process involved. That's why I drew it one, two, three. Typically it's iterative, it doesn't have to be. Well, what we want is an algorithm, what we hope we've designed is an algorithm which will find the grammar, and of course the grammar will generate certain kinds of data, which is closest to the red data. So let's see if this will work any better. Yeah, well, maybe. So the computational linguist is interested in measuring that different distance in some, in some fashion, in some way that's convincing to them and to their colleagues. So with over a bunch of collections of data, you work to see what the best grammar is within this class, this family of grammars, how, what the best one is uh, in connection with that data. And the important point is to be able to have an algorithm that does it. You don't go looking for it and hoping that God uh, assume that we'll find a better grammar within the class of grammars that you're studying. And so they say, what we want to do is measure how good this system is by looking at a large set of a large class of uh, collections of data, and basically summing or averaging whatever um, this distance here. And that's essentially, that's the no, that's the, the essence of being an empiricist, is saying, as the ACL members can say, I know my grammars aren't perfect. You seem to think that the grammar has to be inside the only yellow box that you set up. We know that the grammars you're generating aren't perfect. Oh, we're going to measure their goodness or their badness in a quantitative method, showing how distant the best grammar is from where we have to be. So it's a very different perspective on things. And I think there are two takeaways from this. The one is that the computational linguist always insists on a quantitative measure of how bad they're doing at any given time. This is something that's very difficult for a linguist to do. Partly because usually you'll, you'll get a score of like 37 out of 100 the first time around. And if you're maybe from France, then an idea of a, tw a grade of 12 or, or 14 sounds good, but if a 37 out of 100 sounds really, really bad. But that's kind of how it is. That's kind of how it is to be um, a scientist. So on the one hand, there is this uh, commitment to uh, quantitative evaluation of how theory is working. And on the other, there's a commitment to an algorithm which produces the grammar. Um, and that's something that people talk about more and more uh, in institutes like this one. Um, so the second thing I'd like to talk uh, a bit about with you is two styles of computing. And the first thing I'm not going to say much about, I'm going to assume that you all know a certain amount about it. The first is the von Neumann architecture of the computer. That it's called that is a little bit odd. There were many people who worked on it, not just John von Neumann. But that's basically how it's called. And here's a picture on the right. We've got a computer, and there, inside its memory, there can be both data and program. There's a control unit. Um, there's the program that um, it, uh, deals with the traffic um, of information from one cell to another, so to speak, or one, in, one point in memory, moving into a register, and so forth and so on. I'm going to assume you roughly know how these things work. But the, um, I'm going to talk to you rather about neural nets, which is something you almost certainly don't know much about. And I'm going to explain to you that um, we're now in the fourth generation, so we're in the generation, the fourth generation is essentially uh, deep learning. And that's the fourth generation. I'm going to start at the beginning. In the first generation, there's a really great story. The first generation involves just two people, um, Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts. And yeah, I got to tell you, I'll read you this this thing, but, I, but what's really interesting is the person side to this. So they developed a model in which there are units which correspond to neurons, and they were very much up on the latest experimental results in neurophysiology. So they understood about um, they understood that that neurons could inhibit the activation of another neuron in addition to activating the in addition to Activation. Um, they knew that um, neurons could be 
Um, that it, it, it was a very reasonable abstraction to say that a neuron is either firing or it's not firing. Yes or no. Nothing in the universe is perfectly yes or no, but neurons come close. After firing, there's a refractory period, and that can't be um, made shorter. So that refractory period makes it reasonable for a person who's doing the mathematics of a neural net to say that time has become discretized. And so there are these two initial discretization um, simplifications of reality that they undertook. So units are either on or off, and we can think about computation being done in time to a metronome, so to speak. Trump, Trump, Trump. Um, and they published a paper in 1943, and this excited many, many people. Um, John von Neumann, who was in charge, one of the people in charge of the development of the computer as part of a war effort, wrote up the, the signal paper that um, explained where the United States was going with their computers, and it made a number of references to the material that had just come out in the um, Macaulay and Pitts paper. Um, this 1943 paper led to work by Stephen Keeney at the beginning of the 1950s when he was a graduate student, developing the notion of finance today, automata. It hadn't existed before, and he based his work on an understanding of the Macaulay and Pitts story. Well, the story about neural nets. I want to tell you something about Walter Pitts. It's a great story. It's the, um, it's a great story. Walter Pitts was born in 1922 from a working class family uh, near Detroit, and he was an unhappy kid, and at the age of 16, he ran away. He probably heard, uh, it, it was a big deal in the news, as you can see here, Robert Maynard Hutchins, who was the president of the University of Chicago at that time, and made the decision to open the college to kids who had graduated from 10th grade. So they could do their first two years, their first two college years at the University of Chicago. If they were bright and mature enough, they could come, they would be welcome. And Walter Pitts decided that was the place to go. He, he, he had no money, he couldn't be admitted. He, he essentially, as far as we can tell, was a homeless guy of 16, 17. But it was very exciting. It was a great time to be at that place. Um, there was a year when Bertrand Russell um, spent a year. There's a long story about Bertrand Russell, a wonderful talk about it. Both Bertrand Russell and Rudolf Carnap were at the University of Chicago. Carnap was one of the people in the Vienna Circle, we'll come back to him, who had to leave um, Austria with the rise of Nazism. Um, Russell had different challenges in his life, but he too had to get away. Um, so they were both there. This is a story about a bench in the University of Chicago. Maybe it's that bench, probably not. <laughs> but Walter Bitch was seated on a bench, let's say that one. And he was reading one of the books of logic of Rudolf Carnap. And this tall, white-haired gentleman sits down on the bench next to him, and you can imagine, obviously, who it was, looks over to uh, the book that he's reading and strikes up a conversation. And the young man explains to him all the, the faults that he sees in the book. And, and obviously, it's Bertrand Russell who says, well, you know, Carnap's a professor here. You really should go talk to him. So the rest of the story, you know, from Carnap's memoirs, he says, this young man came to me. I assumed he was a student here. And he said, Professor Carnap, I'm reading your book. And there are several places that aren't clear to me. And Carnap writes in his memoirs, now, when I say something isn't clear to me, that means I disagree. I think it's wrong. And so uh, he said it wasn't clear to him. So I took the book down from my shelf, and we went over these passages. And after I discussed it with him, I agreed that it wasn't clear. <laughs> and so, after that, he continued with seminars with Nicholas Ryshevsky, who was a Russian emigre. You know, in these, these stories I'm telling you, the LSA were all emigrants. We're all emigrants here to this country. Uh, Rudolf Karnin, Bertrand Russell. Um, it started sitting on a seminar that was being run by um, Ryshevsky, to say, on you know, mathematical biology. And they were studying the nervous system, neurons and stuff. And there was a gentleman there, Warren McCulloch, who you might be able to tell it from this picture about who got his looks from Jehovah. And uh, Warren McCulloch was a psychiatrist. He was a professor at the University of, Ch of Illinois in Chicago Circle. Um, and he participated in this group because he was interested in the mind. He was interested in cognition. 
What is a number such that so that a, a human can understand it? And what is a human who can understand a number? He was interested in the philosophical foundations of the work that he did, and he met this 16 or 17 year old, basically homeless kid. Got to know him and said, oh, look, my wife wrote a very wonderful person. We'd be happy if you came and stayed with us. So, so that's what happened. It's moved into their house, and they discovered they had everything to talk about, from lightness to topology to uh, neurophysiology. And out of that came this 1943 paper, um, which set the world on fire. My colleague tried to find somebody that was smart enough to be able to deal with this, because he sure wasn't even close to it and realized that probably Norbert Wiener at MIT, who was just inventing cybernetics, was probably the only person who, who was smart enough. So after a number of years of computing, my colleague and Pitts and my colleague's uh, family, his wife, um, moved with him to Cambridge. And then a really tragic thing happened, and I can tell you exactly what it is. It's very unpleasant, but it's, it's, it's in the public domain now. What happened led to Wiener's simply cutting off all communication with Pitts and McCulley. And uh, Pitts continued to work for a while and then basically started drinking and, and he drank himself to death. It's a, very, it's a very sad story. But this is the second, this is the first generation of neural nets and I hope you'll never forget that story. The second generation of neural nets really involves, well, it's either one person or three people. If it's one person, it's this one. It's Frank Rosenblatt. And he was at Cornell University he was inspired by McCulloch and Pitts, but he created something that was much more in the spirit of what followed in generations three and four. Um, so he created um, what he called the perceptron. The perceptron was a big step forward. There were parameters inside the perceptron, but they could be learned by the perceptron. There was nobody who was actually going to have to write a program. The perceptron could be used to recognize things like, like shapes, for example. Perhaps we have a, an artificial retina onto which we will um, project shapes, and we'd like to have a neuron that will fire if it's a square and not fire if it is a very basic kind of pattern recognition. And rather than writing a program for it, Rosenblatt's goal was to have a, a system whereby we could give it various examples, some are circles, some are squares, some are other things, and when it predicted, or when it told us, when it labeled correctly, then there would be one change to the way that would be, and when it labeled incorrectly, there would be a different change. Um, actually, if it did it right, it didn't change the way. It's only if it made a mistake in either direction that he would change the ways. And what he was able to prove, and this was spectacular at the time, was although perceptrons cannot learn everything, far from it, if they can learn to solve a problem, then this very basic, what's called the perceptron rule, using the perceptron rule, you can always get your perceptron to make the distinction you're talking about. If it's possible, there are many things that perceptrons can do, but if you're looking at something it can do, you can, fit, you can get it, you can persuade it, so to speak, teach it to make the distinction without yourself going inside and changing any of the parameters. And that was huge. But, so many things made this different from what preceded. But maybe the biggest thing to keep our eye on is that from this point on, representations were, were almost never um, related to a single neuron. One was almost all, one is almost always looking at collections of neurons. Each of these cells, let's call them, um, may have an activation value, but what we're almost always interested in is the pattern of activations, which in most cases is much, uh, much better represented as a, as a vector um, than it is as a, as a real number. So the new style of thinking about neural nets um, really started here with Rosenblatt. He died in 1971. Um, and in 1969, Minsky and Packard, who were two of the real leaders of the artificial intelligence movement that began in the late 50s, published a book on pers uh, perceptrons. And it was widely viewed as a, a very sharp criticism of uh, neural networks. Um, 
they were able to show that there were some things that seemed very straightforward that perceptrons couldn't learn. We knew that before. They say Rosenbach knew that, that it couldn't learn just anything. But they did a pretty good job on persuading people there were a lot of things that perceptron couldn't do. Um, they, they were also aware that you couldn't stack perceptrons and get a, a, a better system. Stacking perceptrons didn't make them better. So um, after this time, the 1970s was basically a down time for neural nets in, in the United States. If you're interested in this general area, and if you're at all interested in how knowledge develops, then this is a wonderful book, Talking Nets. It's a, an oral history, the conversations with two people who were themselves involved in this work, Anderson and Rosenfeld. And these are all the people who were involved before that decade or during that decade. And you know, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what is one of the interesting things to keep track of. In the 1980s, something special happened that brought neural nets back into the public uh, awareness, public attention. And um, there were two things that could be brought into these, what now would be called feed-forward networks. By the 1980s, they were called feed-forward networks. So all of the perceptron style of computing was considered to be um, forward, uh, forward feeding, so to speak. Um, so a number of people discovered that you could integrate a nonlinear function into the architecture, and this would allow stacking to uh, solve any problems that hadn't seen solved before. Let me explain a little bit what this means, putting a nonlinear function in. So the basic idea, as I've already explained to you, is that within a neural net, any particular neuron is connected to another bunch of neurons that's sending activation, either positive or negative, its way. And so all of those messages, which are numbers, are coming in and they're getting added up. And what people started doing in the 1980s was putting a function in between that was nonlinear. It, was, it had to be differentiable but nonlinear. That's why we learned all those things in college about differentiability. You put that in there, then it becomes possible to stack networks, stack networks, and make much more powerful systems. At the same time, five people independently discovered how you could trace back over all of these weights, how you could trace back the message that the trainer was giving to the neural network. Oh, you got that one wrong. I told you that was the big step that Rosenbach had done. He could train his neural network, and when it made a wrong labeling of a, of a shape, there was a very simple method for it to take that error and redo its weights. Well, in the 80s, several people came up with what eventually came to be known as backpropagation or backprop. And that was a much fancier way of doing the same thing. So the combination of these two things is nonlinear, uh, this nonlinear input of activations and backprop led to a tremendous um, a tremendous improvement in the ability of the, of the networks to, to work and therefore a tremendous interest throughout a, a large number of fields. So there were these two volume works, parallel distributed, parallel distributed processing that came out of the big research group at UC, UC San Diego to that point. They were very successful with dealing with a lot of areas and what about language? And I I was there for people talking about this, and there were lots of different points of view as to what connectionism, and these blue books here, they call themselves connections, was a style of neural network. Um, so there's a lot of disagreement as to what the take home message was for people who were worried about language. There's a second point that I think is uh, perhaps even more important from my perspective, uh, please. And that was that in this third generation, there were really two types of neural nets. The first is the feed forward that I mentioned to you. But there was another group of uh, scholars who were interested in what were then called recurrent networks. And I want to say to you, you'll hear about recurrent networks in generation four. And they actually have nothing to do with one another. It's really unfortunate that the term was reused. The recurrent networks were also called hot field networks. And these were networks where things weren't being passed forward, so that each neuron would communicate with a large neighborhood 
of neurons around it. And this had a beautiful mathematics to it, which John Hopfield, who was a physicist, first, first discovered or explored. And with these systems, it was very natural to think of the different states it could be in as being positions on an energy landscape where the neural network would always be trying to move to a lower position on, on an energy network. Here's a very, very simple example of that. Paul Smolevsky was one of the people who developed a very beautiful model in that um, two-volume PDP work. Yeah. So Jeffrey Hinton, and Terry Sosnowski and Paul Smolevsky were two of the people who did really interesting work um, in that context. And this book here, it's hard to read. Um, it's a, well, it's hard to read. Two sentences. Um, <laughs> it's called Modeling Brain Function, the World of Attractor Neural Networks by a former physicist named Ben Miller. He who turned himself into a, a neural network person. So very, very interesting book, very exciting. This book is not an easy book to read. Okay, I want to turn to deep learning just a, a, I'll say a little bit about it. The, Elements of which these neural nets are built up are much more sophisticated. Obviously, the computational power now is much greater than it was 30 years ago. Deep learning models are using a lot of data, but we have a lot of data now that they didn't have 30 years ago. So all of these things are both good news and bad news. But there are excellent results in vision and language. Should linguists take it seriously? I think absolutely we should. Should we have taken seriously what was going on in the 80s? Yeah, and I think a lot of people did. It meant, for example, learning more about mathematics and trying to think how linguistic models could be modified to use the tools that they have. But they're deeply interested in and have interesting things to say about the nature of learning, which most of us believe is central to doing linguistics. So the two things that I think we, as linguists, should be paying attention to is, first of all, what these guys call embedding. Now, Embedding didn't start with neural nets, but it's been, it's been an, an important part of their work. So embedding means for each word in the language you're looking at, it doesn't have to be word, it can be morphing, whatever. You find a point, you assign it a point, which is to say a set of coordinates in a space of high dimensionality. Okay, it sounds like the Twilight Zone, but you get accustomed to it eventually. And what that means is you can talk about directionality, you can talk about distance. How distant are these two words? Do these three words form a triangle? If they do, is there another word inside? All these things which you can assign linguistic meaning to. In fact, really interesting. So we can ask whether the questions we are thinking of as linguists can be formulated in the terms of these concepts. So I think it's absolutely worth our attention as much as we can pay to it. There's another thing that they do, which nobody had done before, that they're doing the language, and I think we want to pay a lot of attention to it. And that is, they seem to have been able to take a whole sentence, a sequence of a, not a fixed number of words, and assign it to a point in the side-dimensional space. And that's remarkable, too. And they're using this technology to try to answer linguistic questions. Do, do I think it's going to change linguistics as such? I don't think it should change the questions that we ask. But I think it absolutely will change the tools that we have uh, to, to provide our answers, and I think that in turn will change the way we think about language and the way we do language. Okay. I have not been talking as fast as I intended to, and you might find that difficult to believe, but there you are. I want to tell a little bit of a story that begins with Immanuel Kant, but I promise you it will bring us up to Denver Grammar in the middle of the 20th century. So, let's start the story. The end of the 18th, end of the 18th story, Immanuel Kant, a famous philosopher, believed that he was able to bridge the gap between rationalists and empiricists. And the way he believed that he could bridge that gap was to identify certain characteristics that we might call um, faculties, space, time, causality. These were central to what we would today call cognition. And he believed that these were part of any mind that could interact with the world and found around it. And that was the source of the certainty that we had about um, these three faculties. We were, in effect, looking at faculties which were necessary for us to even exist as a mind. Well, that was all well and good, but there were some people, mathematicians, who looked at this and they said, well, you know, we sell certainty. That's our product. How is our certainty going to fit in here? 
and the Gonfian said, not a problem. Space, that's what you geometrists study. You are studying the um, inner structure of the faculty of space. Time, that'll do for the rest of mathematics, because time is all about counting one, two, three. So you've got ordinal counting, you've got the integers, it's not a problem to create the rational numbers and all the other numbers. Time gives you number, space gives you geometry, you're all set. The mathematicians were fine with that, but they, and they went away, but they actually had a problem that they weren't going to tell anybody else. And that was the fifth, the parallel postulate in geometry, which says, I don't know if I have a picture of this, no, I don't. I did. If you have a straight line, well, and a point off it, Euclid's axiom says, through that point, you can find one and only one line that's parallel to the original line. No. And geometrists were thinking, yeah, we really ought to be able to prove that. We really ought to be able to prove it. It shouldn't be an independent axiom. So a lot of mathematicians tried to imagine asserting the opposite of that, hoping it would bring us to a contradiction. And it didn't work out that way. People would find various ways of denying that postulate, finding an alternative position, and they would always lead to interesting and surprising geometries. And in the end, mathematicians decided, you know, there are really three worlds of geometry based on different kinds of curvature. And that was great for the PhD the students in math because there were now two new worlds about which no theorems had been published. And that was great. But it was a problem, really, for, ultimately it was a problem for, for Kant, or he was dead, but for, for this approach, because how could it be that for 2,000 years there had been absolute certainty, and then, yeah, well, okay, but we got it wrong. Well, it shouldn't be that you can get it wrong if you really are selling certainty. And so this guy, David Hilbert, at the end of the 19th century, he said, well, let's do what needs to be done. And he said, what we need to do is be very careful about our axioms and very careful about our rules of inference. We're going to do it right this time. And so in 1899, he published exactly that. And he urged people to do this kind of axiomatization for other fields of mathematics and for other quantitative sciences. He was very involved, he was very uh, interested in physics, worked in this area. Um, and um, Hilbert's program, it, for us there's a bifurcation, because a, there's two ways in which it breaks off and uh, become important for our story. So part of his program said we're going to start with a set of axioms for the discipline that we're looking at. And we're going to require that all the rules of inference be um, perfectly explicit. He also said that one of the reasons we're doing this is so that we can always create a responsible interface between two sciences. Where when I say science, it could be math, it could be science. So each science could responsibly talk to its neighboring science, and ultimately we would have a unified science. And there were two, as I say, two uh, paths that led out of this. The first were people who were mathematicians and logicians trying to answer one of the questions that Hilbert had formulated, but it was in this general program. For example, the question, um, if you've got a formal uh, model with a set of axioms and a set of uh, rules of entrance, can you be sure that anything that's true in that system can be proven? And I would certainly hope that that would be the case, and as many of you know, that was what Gödel showed was wrong. As long as the system is rich enough to include arithmetic, sorry, Professor Hilbert, we will have true statements that can't be proven. This created uh, a whole new field, many fields at that point, and I'm going to come back to this in a second. I'll just mention some of the names here. Alonzo Church was an American who created blended calculus in the context of this work. Um, Alan Turing was doing work very similar to Kurt Gödel, but he created what we today call a Turing machine. He called it an automatic machine. Emil Post was an American who, before Turing, about 10 years before Turing, created a machine. He didn't call it a Post machine. He might have called it a Turing machine if he'd known. But it was very, very similar, remarkably similar to the Turing machine, but he couldn't, he didn't end up proving the theorem that, um, uh, that Gödel did. 
However, this is what we're going to turn to in about five minutes, so this is about pointing ahead. Engel Post developed some beautiful mathematics, which at the end of the 1940s was taken by a young mathematician um, named Paul Rosenblum, who wrote a wonderful textbook showing how you can understand Post's system. So we'll come back to that. That's one of the directions that we're looking at. The, the second direction is this idea of axiomatization. And I want to read, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about that. So, a little bit about older. Um, um, the, so the second, the second uh, uh, path that I'd like to say that I, was his impact on the Vienna Circle. So the Vienna Circle was a group of philosophers and scientists who cared a great deal about philosophy. Their interest and their interest working together began around the time of the First World War. They became a very active group in the 1920s and in the 30s up until the rise of Hitler, basically. And they were interested in a number of things. The unity of science was a huge part of it. It was an idea that had developed out of, out of Hilbert's work. They very much viewed themselves as developing um, Hilbert's work, also the work of Hans Knopf and others. So they were interested in the unity of science, and they, were they came to the conclusion that the source of necessity was not a Kantian faculty. It was rather language itself. And we have to understand language itself if we're going to ever do philosophy or if we're ever going to do science right. Here's a quick uh, map of these wonderful people in the Vienna Circle. You may know uh, Barbara He was an important person in the last of Jenner Grammar and Chief Translation. Many of the other names you may know. Uh, I won't uh, stay with them um, too long. Um, yeah, so these, these are the yeah, circle led by Martin Schlick. What I'd like to show is just a couple of things in which uh, these philosophers basically say syntax is too important to be left for the links. And it's wonderful to hear it, and it's surprising. And you read this, and you say, well, what did we do? What did we do? I was like, well, you yeah, know, what we did is no time. So, yeah. So he, here's some things from the introduction to Hans Reichenbach's book, uh, Hans Reichenbach's book on logic, published in 1947. And it's me in the yellow there, but it's him underneath. I may add the remark that my personal fortunes were a great help in the writing of this book. The migration of intellectuals which followed the disastrous political developments in Germany, you know what we're talking about, right? has greatly contributed to an exchange of the various standards of civilization, and I, for one, cannot but be grateful to us fate which led me into various countries, not as a traveler, but as a teacher and collaborator in the education of youth. But no, he went to Turkey, and Turkey took him, and then later came to UCLA. Um, I am grateful as, to be a teacher and a collaborator in the education of youth. I, th I thus have taught logic and scientific methods in various countries, various languages, and I've studied the reaction of students of many nationalities to instruction in a scientific logic. At the same time, the necessity of teaching in several languages led me to try to adapt the methods of symbolic logic to the study of conversational language. He's a proto linguist. And I thus undertook an inquiry which turned out to be useful for the understanding of the logic language. Yes. The present book is the first systematic presentation of such dual use of logistic symbolism. And I should be glad, now we're listening, if the philologist, as us, could make use of these contributions by a logician who advances no claim to be an expert in philology and symbolism, but who feels that the state of traditional grammar is always in model by its two millennial ties to a logic that cannot account even for the simplest linguistic forms. Our present grammar, as it is taught, with its artificial classifications and gratuitous constructions, is based on obvious misunderstandings of the structure of language. It's easy, it's easy to back a lot of it. We should like to hope that the results of symbolic logic will someday, in the form of a modernized grammar, find their way into elementary schools. It seems to us that the deficiencies of traditional grammar are equally visible in the science of language in its present edition. The high level of historical and psychological analysis in philology is not matched by a similar level of the understanding of the logical side of language. And if, the, if linguists would try to make use of a modernized grammar for linguistic purposes, they might discover new means of elucidating the nature of languages. And in the hope that our appeal will be heard outside the camp of logicians 
and will be taken up by the few linguists who are aware that the science of language cannot be disheartened about the same thing. logic we present in the following sections. The present status of logistic analysis of conversational language and indicate the outlines of the logistic crime. He's just saying we need linguistics, we need it to be done right. So he was the head of the group of logical uh, positivists in Berlin. Karnak was the, in a sense, the, the leader in some sense of the group in Vienna. Karnak published this work in, I think it's 1935, mid 1934, in translation, something he originally wrote in German. And it's the same story, but with a slightly different focus. I'd like to just show you a little bit of this. Um, the logical syntax of language. By the logical syntax, also briefly, syntax of a language, we shall understand the system of formal, that is, not referring to meaning, rules of that language, as well as the consequences of these rules. There we deal first with the formation, formative rules, German forming, which decree how from the symbols words, of the language proposition can be built up, secondly, with the transformation rules. You can imagine how I responded to this on the side. Um, which decree um, how given propositions from given propositions and ways to be brought. If the rules are set up strictly formally, they provide they furnish mechanical operations with symbols of language. The formation and transformation of propositions resembles chess as socio us. Like chess figures, words are here combined and manipulated according to definite rules. But thereby we do not say that language is nothing but a game of figures. It is not denied that the words and propositions have a meaning. One merely averts methodologically from meaning. One may express it also thus. Language is treated as a cocktail. And it goes on and on. Um, your, your attention, maybe. We need a bit. There's more of it. It's, it's, it's very, it goes on and on, and it's all very special. So, uh, I'd like to kind of draw this together. And the way I'd like to, to draw it together, this is the first piece of it, another one having to do with post in just a second. There was this guy, Bartola, and I won't ask for show of hands to tell you, you know, but he was, he was a formative, partly insider, partly outsider. Um, he was a great admirer of Carnap. Um, he was friends with Sally Harris, and he became very good friends with Noam Chomsky. He was a bit older than Chomsky. And he was in the United States as the leader of the first machine translation group at MIT in the early 1950s. And during that time, he published two articles in language, so all linguists read it. He published two articles that show the impact of, of, of uh, Hilbert the Vienna Circle, and I want to just show you a little bit of each of them. In an article in 1954 called Logical Syntax and Semantics, in which you can read a little bit of it, in which he says basically, yes, Zellick Harris has shown how we can construct a formal syntax in the way um, that Karnak is calling syntax. But at the same time, the rules of transformation that Karnak is talking about involve characterizations of what inferences can be drawn, and we linguists should do that too. If one sentence's meaning is a consequence of the meaning of another sentence, surely that's something that linguists should care about every bit as much as anything else. So you publish that article. I don't know why you haven't read it. I don't know why I haven't decided to see this either. It's very interesting. Um, so, of course, it's, it's also interesting how I fit into the gender story, and I will say like one more word about that. But I want to just pull together this second time. So the, the second has to do with these logicians here who are following up on Hilbert's call to axiomatize arithmetic in all fields of, of uh, all fields of mathematics. So I mentioned Abel Post. He created a Turing machine. I want that answer, so to speak. Um, and this young man named Paul, Paul Rosenfield <coughs> publishes this short book in Introduction to Logical, to the Mathematical Logic. And there it is. This book was published in 1950, and Noam Chomsky was a, a senior in college, and Henry Yeesh was a linguist who taught this, used this book to teach the course. And the last chapter in this book, it's amazing. It's the, the general syntax of language. And he says, you know what? Everything that we've been doing in this book about uh, proofs, you could turn around and you could say that a sentence is grammatical if you find a proof for it. 
And I can just read some of this to you now. It's, it's really marvelous. We have up to now studied logic mostly as a deductive science, although we've indicated blah, 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 that we might approach logic by considering the language and its formal rules of argument and interpretation. Um, so he sets this up and he talks about a, a grammar. He said we could use the rules that come from any good grammar book, which shows that he never read a good grammar book. And two pages, a couple pages later, he points out another way of looking at these languages is to consider the productions as instructions to a moron who can, it's a little bit of who can scan a string and recognize it as being of a certain form or producing theorems starting from the absence to having a moron can regularly following the instruction to generate as many theorems as he pleases. And it's very interesting. And all of the notation that he develops there is the notation that Jones uses in logical structure of linguistic theory. So here's, so this is a 1955 uh, manuscript of LSLT. And the, the handwritten notes are in Jones' second version of it, which he did in 1956, is he went back to the Wagner library and gave a, a modified version of it. He says, we may call each rule of the form one a conversion, which would later be a fully circular. A sentence grammar thus bears a certain formal analogy to a formal proof. A proof of a theorem in a formalized theory is a finite sequence of lines, each of which is either an axiom or follows the law of how you see. And then he says at the end, so the theorems are the lowest level of representations, and here the analogy. There's a lot to more to be said, but there's a tremendously interesting flow of ideas and enthusiasm through this theory. And speak over some of these other things here, and I just turn to some conclusions. And these are really the points in, in this book, The Battle of the Minefield, which uh, I wrote with a colleague and friend, Don Dykes. Um, all advances are made by young people, you guys, and they're always made with the goal in mind of liberating the young people from the shackles of a method or theory that their teachers have given to them. It's always the case. I mean, I see it now, and I know I have to step back and say, you're doing it right. You have to discover for yourself what it is you want to be liberated from, and then go and do it. The past is built up of ruptures and continuities. And, you know, you may have noticed that I've been talking for an hour or so, and it has not been linguistics at least in a strict sense. We have not been talking about the properties of language. We've been talking about the properties of linguistics. We've been studying linguistics. And although that's not exactly what we get paid for as, as linguists, we do get paid to study language. The fact is that to be trained, to be educated, and to write in linguistics, you have to actually think about linguistics. You have to know some linguistics. So although you think the main thing you're doing is studying languages, at the same time, you have to be a good thinker about the character, the very character of our field itself. And that's what I'm trying to do in this study. And I think it's very interesting. I think it changes the way we look at our, uh, ourselves and the work that we do. And I'll, add, I'll finish on one kind of moral note because there is a kind of a normal, uh, sorry, normative character to this work. It's not just observing what's happening. And the normative character comes in when we say, why is there linguistics rather than nothing? We don't have departments of chess. Chess exists. But we have departments of linguistics. What are we doing that makes us worth it? We need to be able to give an answer to that question. A big part of the answer is the human race or Western civilization or something has developed a lot of really important information about how languages work. And a few of us choose to make this our life work. And our job is to find out all that has been done that needs to be passed on to the next generation. Along the way, if we can add a little bit more to on top of what we passed down from the past, that is great. But if we don't make it our moral responsibility to pass that information on down, 
there really isn't any reason for any of us to have these jobs that that pay for our for our lives. We are responsible for bringing knowledge down. We can add to it if we can, but there's more that we have to do. And that's, I think, the most important lesson I take away from writing this book. Thank you. I'm not sure if they're there, so I can't find them. 
I, I, I won't take them up here, but there's a very famous passage in Chomsky and Syntactic Structures where he explains we can't come up with models that take data and give us grammars. We can't come up with, we can't even come up with the next batch gram, uh, devices that take a grammar and a set of data and tell us if the grammar's right or not. The only thing we can do is come up with grammars, the uh, only thing we can do is come up with a device that'll take a set of data and two grammars and say which of the two is better. You should be thinking about my ACL sort of idea of what, uh, what uh, an ACL linguist would, would do and would have the success. Um, so he things he wrote made it clear that he was aware it didn't quite work the way he wanted. So Chomsky so filled in a few more details in this third model, which is take, a, uh, take two grammars and a set of data in my model will tell you which is the better one. Um, he, he realized, so he spelled it out by saying if only one of the grammars actually generates all the data, then you choose it. That's, that's obvious. If, you, if both grammars generate the data, then we'll choose between them by selecting the grammar which is shorter than that. And he knew that there was no logical verification in what he was doing. And there are hints here and there where he, he saw he didn't have it. But I would say that in the post 1970s, post 1980 world, world, we can do what Chomsky couldn't do and sort of came close to. And this involves linking up probability with algorithmic complexity. Uh, there's another uh, direction to go off in. But I believe that many aspects of Chomsky's kind of general idea, if general idea includes the notion of calculating the complexity of a grammar, which has really gone by the wayside in, in generative grammar since the late 70s. Um, if you bring that back in, I think there's a lot that's very interesting about Chomsky's um, notion of explanation based on algorithmic complexity. Um, so I ended up kind of giving you a personal opinion, but at least there's more details there about how things fit together. Thanks, John. Um, so, uh, I'm going to have a story before my question. Uh, I have a question for you. What year did you graduate as an undergraduate? That's what I was in. Class of 72. Class of 72. So, for those of you that don't know, John is one of the two most famous uh, linguists to have graduated from Swarthmore College. Uh, he and Barbara Parti were undergraduates at Swarthmore. There were others. I know John Michael, he went there as an undergraduate. But uh, this connects to James Mitchner, the novelist, who also went to Swarthmore, and with his millions created an endowment where he wanted to provide an opportunity for minority scholars to teach at Swarthmore. It was an affirmative action program, provided an opportunity for me to teach at Swarthmore. I began my teaching career there in 1975, you were already legendary as a young linguist who had gone off to do great things. I was at the University of Pennsylvania, and my story then connects back to Penn, because I studied syntax with Zelig Harris, thoroughly intimidated by Zelig, who at that time, as Benjamin Franklin professor, lived on kibbutz almost the entire year. He could come back and teach syntax for two weeks, day after day, he worked in 50 languages from four by six cards. Since I didn't know, Jer uh, you know Japanese, Arabic, Chorti, and uh, you know uh, various other languages, when he talked about the noun phrase, and uh, he typically did it on you know 15 different languages, you could not possibly keep up. But Zelda Harris hated, well, hated psychology and was uh, disheartened by Chomsky's abandonment of his conception of a pure linguistic science that he felt was far more advanced than the model field of psychology. Right? I look at your diagram, I did not see B.F. Skinner. Some of us are old enough to remember that Chomsky's catapult in the Battle of the Minefields was taken down Skinner. Right? Um, I don't know if that fits into your yeah, work at all. It's totally that. So the, this this is the book here. This is um, the publisher said it was a brick in my right. That's nothing. 
And it's, it's a big, thick book, but it only takes up to um, just before World War II. So the next part of the story will include Chomsky and, and Skinner. And now, behaviorism is an important, an important thing. So we do talk a lot about behaviorism and the, and the Watson first generation behaviorism. I want to get back to all the interesting things that that's worth going on, but I'm answering your, your, your last question about behaviorism and how it's going to fit in. Um, one thing that we've, we found and talked about it in this book is we looked at psychology in the period from 1920 to 1940. The United States, in, in, in this discipline of psychology, was really divided into, into two groups. One, the larger group, really was heavily influenced by, by Skinner and by the philosophy of science as it was um, worked out in the Vienna Circle and, and their cousins, so to speak, in the United States. The other group were the Gestalt psychologists who were essentially all um, immigrants who had, who had left Europe to, to flee Hitler. Um, both sides continued their work. Certainly many of the, Germ uh, the German immigrants felt that they had landed on an island of completely uncultured people and um, didn't have difficulty in expressing their view about it. It is very, very interesting. And um, I only, actually after reading this book, come to understand how psychology and linguistics were, were not as advanced as some other fields like sociology. So sociology during this period was much more in tune with um, traditional philosophical and anthropological um, tradition. So the story of behaviorism, yeah, it's, a, it's a big part of the, the American story. And we've only started it here in the story. That will be another story. And Swarthmore, yeah, was a great place to do linguistics. I was there for four years, and my second to fourth year was the Lagut Lightman era. And so I, I became a linguist you know, pretty much because of Lagut Lightman. And she was just a fabulous teacher. Um, Ray Jackenoff was another uh, sort of more linguist than there are So Barbara Partee was in the first class at MIT. She graduated in 61. And, you know, although I got to MIT in 72, I realize now there's not much but it felt to me like there were giants in the earth, like Robert Pensi and Jim McCauley and so forth. Um, yeah, that was great. I'm, I'm really glad to hear your story. I'd love to hear more stories about Southern Harris. There's always room for more. Um, so, I, I was a bit surprised to see your distinction between digital computation and neural network computation, at least in your diagram. And then to see the remainder of the talk talk about how the linguists' serious adoption of logical and mathematical techniques, and ultimately the theory of computation, exploded linguistics on the, like, the main field. And, in fact, and a lot of, it allowed linguists to contribute not only to the study of language, but to other fields. So for example, context-free languages where the foundation of modern programming languages. Um, how does linguists, say, a young linguist, make a similar serious adoption of neural network computation, and yet not just adopt the methods, but contribute from the study of language to the study of whatever this new computation is, in a way that's as meaningful as the way that it happened in the 50s? Yeah. So I'll try to paraphrase that um, in, in my words. What do you do if you're a young scholar, maybe a graduate student, or maybe soon after your graduate studies, and you're excited both about the study of language and you're excited about this new style of computation? And I, I realize as I say those words, I'm trying to paraphrase you, I see exactly at least two of my graduate students, and, and probably a third who, who's supposed to it, and one is in computer science and one is in linguistics. One computer science is much more of a mathematician than the other one, although the other one has learned more math than anybody I've ever seen in a period of 24 months. So how do you then take what you know about linguistics and hope that you'll have an impact on really hardcore computer science or hardcore um, deep learning? You know, I, I spend more time trying to think that I would be able to teach that I would have something to say. Of course, I'm saying, I, you, you want to know what a young person should do. But I, I, 
guess it's often the same. I think that linguists should be able to talk to people in deep learning or computer science and say, your methods allow me to answer a question that was important to me that I couldn't do before. Let me explain to you why it's an important question. Um, so I think we can always do that. I, I don't know that there's an answer to the question, how can a, a young linguist who maybe has one foot in computation and one foot in linguistics, how can they go out and be sure that what they're going to do is going to have an impact on, on uh, computer science? You know, we never know, ultimately, where, where our impact is, is going to be. So uh, I, I think you just go with your heart, in a sense, your heart and your mind. Are we, were you hoping for a better answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, just the historical sort of reflection on, on learning from the past. Yeah. Okay. Or avoiding mistakes that people made who sort of didn't learn. Yeah. There are, there are definitely lessons to be learned. We could have a really interesting long discussion about the third generation of the PDP group, the parallel processing uh, group, and how they. Um, dealt with language, and there was a lot of back and forth between Steve Baker on the one side and the connectionists on the other. And one of the things that I, but again, this is focusing on saying something to linguists, about linguistics. Um, in that PDP book, there was a lot of discussion of learning the past tense, learning the, the strong, the strong verb, past tense form of strong verbs in English, those are there's, you know, an out loud. So, sing, sang, fun. So as opposed to talk, talk. And um, there was a lot of discussion in this literature, starting off in those two PDP books and then continuing for a bunch of years, in which connections basically said to linguists, you don't have anything that begins to compare to what we have already been able to do in terms of explaining how past tense forms can be learned either individually or as small minority subgroups and so forth. And the linguists never picked up on it. Um, so Steve Pinker and Alan Prince wrote some stuff, and it got really vitriolic. And I, I really didn't pay much attention to it because I felt the thing to do was to be learning something from, from those guys and then to reformulate our linguistic questions as best we could using those new tools. And I, I feel like I got a lot of, out of doing exactly that. But the lesson to be learned, so you're asking me what a lesson is to draw from looking at the past. The lesson it seemed to me, then or a little bit later, was if you want to convince the linguists of something, be sure you pick a topic which the linguists can't say, uh, well, I don't really care about that. And so that's why Jason Riegel, who's my colleague and friend, uh, he and I worked on vowel harmony, for example, from a computational point of view, because we were phonologists and we knew that a phonologist couldn't say, oh, vowel harmony, that's not phonology. You know, there's, there's no more, nothing is more phonological than that. So, that's an important lesson um, as far as trying to uh, make yourself be heard by the rest. Pick, pick your topic carefully. More short questions. Um, I'm Very short. I mean, you, are, you, you have a second volume coming out that I guess is going to take us up to uh, the Chomsky era. The question is, is, do you have a third volume plan that's going to go, say, from that era to modern to today? Yeah, great question. Yeah. So, Lax had always thought we would be going up to at least 1980. I had said we should go up to 1970 because we're at the same age, and that's when I started going to LSA meetings. After that, it becomes much too anecdotal, much too personal. Um, and so this, this book that we were writing grew to a thousand pages and we cut it at a certain point to bring us up to the late 30s. And now that it's cut and I look at it, I think that the next volume is going to be from, again, from the late 30s up until 62 or 63. Society in the United States was very different then. This was the, in France as well, but they call it the Trump Warriors. In the U.S. this period, um, won the war, we, we, we imposed an, a, a geopolitical empire in the world. Everything was great. We had a global enemy called communism. It was terrific. And everything was really was doing great. And then 
Chomsky comes along, and everybody loved him. That's one thing that we, we don't do a good job of remembering how up to 1963, everybody loved him. Chomsky, Charles Hockett was a great supporter of, of his, um, everybody in the university was a big supporter of, of gender impairment. And, um, and things changed around 1963. Kennedy was assassinated. Um, the Warren Commission came out. People stopped believing in the honesty of their government. Um, uh, the uh, civil rights movement, the war in Vietnam, a lot of things changed. And many of those things were integrated into the conception of what it was to do now. It became really clear in the spring of 1968 in, in Paris, where the students just believed, they felt that generative grammar was the philosophy, was the connection to make to, to the next world that would be after the, the benighted past has been um, that way. So, so I think that the second body will, will be up to that, that early moment of optimism. And then, you know, I have to say, after my first week here, I said, the first week here at this institute, I sent Max an email saying, maybe I'll turn the mic off. <laughs> I, I think we're seeing the end of the generative wave. You know, back when I was young, <laughs> the field was divided up with phonology, syntax, and then semantics, and then morphology, and then phonetics. Around 2000, we practiced the right way to analyze the field, and then something happened. And then it got restructured. And then what you talk about are methods like uh, computational methods, ways of looking at learnability, socio-phonetics, socio maybe a sociology that goes beyond phonetics. Um, experimental methods, and I think I've left off something important, documentation. And in it, there's room for generative grammar, but not as the kind of totalizing um, figure that it had, it had felt that it was, and it was for so long. So I, I think we can say that sometime, you know, maybe in 2019, it was the close of a wonderful era. Everything comes to a certain end, and linguistics is doing great, but there's something else ahead of us. So that's a great place to end my <laughs> Over to the party. Thank you.